So for some time now, I've been kind of fascinated by the conversation that's part of the emergent church movement and the emerging church. I ended up this morning um, watching an hour of an interview, and actually it was more of a dialogue between um, Walter Brueggemann and some of the folks who were at the um, emergent church conversation in 2004. Uh, there was a quote that Brueggemann um, had that I just felt was just incredible, and I wanted to share that and uh, do a little reflection on that. He says, I simply do not understand why Christians have such a need to bring things to closure. Midrashic interpretation assumes that texts have many meanings. We have this old cultural habit in the faith that things can only mean one thing. And if things can only mean one thing, then you preclude the conversation. It is that dialogic existence that is most important for the text. And I am inclined to think that we Christians have to relearn that from rabbinic interpretation. I think we lost it with Constantine. You can't build a great empire on dialogue. You can only build an empire on monologue. That is true for the church as well. You have to have a voice of certainty to amass significant power. You're not ever going to hear the Pope say, well, we're going to have to think about that. He doesn't have to think about it. He already knows. That was amazing for me. Um, and of course, Brueggemann is talking specifically about the Christian scriptures and uh, the interpretation and the dialogue of those texts. But uh, I see no reason why that conversation can't be extended further, too, in terms of uh, the meaning of the world around us, the meaning of the news we read, um, the meaning we read in cultural interactions, and what does it mean when someone's dressed a certain way, what does it mean when someone says something to you on the street, and to really imbue um, the, the, the qualities of the divine, that creative force that is... Um, ever present in the world around us into our daily conversations and interactions and then to think about how we read those social interactions. Um, there were a, a lot of different connections in this thing from Brueggemann that I felt um, really felt in line with a lot of the work that I, I've been doing with Theopoetics. And one of the first one of course is when he's talking about losing it with Constantine and the necessity of a single voice. Um, and, that, and that's a challenge that has happened from early on. I think that that's the, the offer of multiplicity. That's the offer of what a plurality has in a poetic vision. That the poetic vision is not a vision of one eye. The poetic vision is of um, a depth. There's a dimension to the language there that, that is deeper than just kind of a rigid um, meaning system, right? So the poetics, poetics enforces plurality. Poetics... Uh, supports multiplicity, and, and that is a theological frame of mind that, that is sometimes hard to get into. He goes on a little bit further and he says, Let me say, though, that in this whole business of conversation, there is a movement in Old Testament studies to address the literary theory of Mikhail Bakhtin. He's a Russian theorist that spent time in Soviet prisons, and his argument is that all great novels are dialogic and have many voices. Many people speak, with, speak of the many selves of the self, and so that makes the self itself a conversation. And if you see someone with a trucker hat that says, God said it, I believe it, you know that the, the conversation of the many selves is being submerged. But it is there in the night. You cannot stop the conversation in the night. What the church has the opportunity to do now is to bring this conversation to the daylight. Because if you give light to the conversation, it can begin to produce energy. If it is kept submerged, it cannot produce energy and is more likely to produce violence. Another connection that I thought was great was with uh, Mikhail Bakhtin. So he's the Russian literary critic and he has this... Um, these ideas about dialogue and how all great no novels are, in fact, just a, a documentation of a dialogue between characters. And um, it's kind of a, a crisscrossed connection here. Uh, Brugman has this thing that he calls the zone of imagination, which is how much further you can think about the world that has yet to come and what you can do to kind of bring yourself there. And I find it particularly interesting. I'm an educator by trade at the moment. I'm a uh, middle school teacher, and there is a... Um, 
pedagogical theory by a guy named Lev Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development, which is, you know, if a student's ability level is here, if you try to challenge him up here, um, he'll just fall apart and won't do anything. But if your student is here and you challenge her uh, here, you know, 10% above her capacity or 12% or something, if we're going to do it numerically, she will grow as a learner. So there's a zone of proximal development. There's what's possible independently, what's possible with help, and then what's just too far above where you are. And I think as ministers and pastors and people of the word in general, this is very important for us that if, if we're working with our congregation or with our peers or, or, or with another human being, if, if they're living in this world and the way that they see the world is here, and this is how they um, read the world, if we challenge them to imagine the kingdom of God as something like this and make their lives like that now, they're going to fall apart, just like our students would if we asked them to do something impossible. As ministers and as pastors and people, uh, of the word, it's our job to slowly and incrementally build up the kingdom in ourselves and in others to envision this world order that is in gospel order um, instead of being ruled by the powers. So I, I love that there's this cross section between Brueggemann and his zone of imagination based on this idea of the Russian theorist um, Bakhtin and also this idea of the education of, of raising people up to new and new levels of Vygotsky. There's this interesting play there that I think is really great. The last thing that I thought I would mention in terms of um, what Brueggemann was doing for me here uh, has to do with his comment that uh, if you see someone with a trucker hat that says, God said it, I believe it, you know that the conversation of the many selves has been submerged, but it is there in the night. You cannot stop the conversation in the night. And that, for me, triggers a lot of the work that Catherine Keller has done in terms of talking about a deep theology or depth theology. So Catherine Keller um, talks a lot about the, the depths and, and the deeps and the waters. Um, she has a book called um, Face of the Deep, um, The Theology of Becoming. And in it she is uh, articulating a um, what's called a tahomic uh, theology. So Teho coming from the uh, Hebrew for the water. So in um, Genesis when the the waters were covered with um, darkness kind of before the creation of the earth. Um, that, that that water that was there before before the creation, um, what, what what lives there? What what is in the deep? And um, trying to think about all the potential that's there. The, the great the greatness that bef before there was the creation and before the Genesis is there there is this power there's there's this waiting presence available to us um, so when he's talking about that the truth lives out in the night and the conversation is there I feel like this is in huge resonance with Catherine Keller's ideas around the necessity of sometimes peering into the depths and moving into the deep and um, that is an idea that uh, is scary. It's certainly scary. It's not as readily accessible as a to-do list handed to you to achieve in uh, kind of the, the heavenly kingdom. Uh, but that investigation, moving into the depths, moving into the dark spaces, uh, confronting our fears and our hurts and our hopes and dreams is something that's necessary. And if, if we do that seeking and we do that searching with an open mind and an ability to um, see things as different meanings and to approach the other um, with an open heart and say, you know, what do you see? And, and learn in the dialogue between ourselves and others. Well, it, it just seems as if that's got to be the way forward. And as we move forward um, into these days and, and weeks and years ahead of us, trying to figure out what will become of this world, uh, it seems as if the only way forward that has any sanity in it and any scrap of, of the life of the Spirit requires us to, to listen listen deeply and to, to see the world as others see it to the best of our ability.